Chapter 2 brings us to talking about decisions and processes within MIS and value-driven business. Decision-making and problem-solving encompass large-scale opportunity-oriented strategically focused solutions. In other words, you're going to start using the technology and the data that you have available in order to make strategic decisions about the business operations or the environment that you're uh, operating in. Organizations today can no longer use a cookbook approach to decision making. There's no cookie cutter solution to this. In this chapter, we will focus on technology to help make decisions, solve problems, and find new and innovative opportunities. We'll be talking about decision support systems, executive information systems, artificial intelligence, business processes, business process mapping, and business process engineering. Um, here are the objectives that we will be talking and covering in this section. Um, in section 2.1, the first half, we will focus on making organizational business decisions. We'll talk about measuring organizational business decisions. We will look at using MIS to make business decisions. And we will look at using artificial intelligence to make business decisions. In the second half, we'll talk about managing business processes and using MIS to improve business process and operations. <clears throat> Making organizational business decisions. Managerial decision making challenges include or involve analyzing large amounts of information. Big data analysis is a huge uh, area and a huge trend within businesses today. Um, if you wrap your hands around uh, being able to analyze and make heads and tails of big data, uh, corporations and organizations look to pay a large amount of money, large salaries for people who can do that. <coughs> Apply sophisticated analysis techniques. That's simply using um, technology available such as uh, the SAS software package or IBM's SPSS, which is a little bit more watered down than SAS, um, to be able to analyze data and make heads or tails of it and to make decisions from that data quickly. Sirius Roebuck changed the shape of an entire industry by being lucky enough to discover a huge untapped market that lay waiting to be discovered. In the 1880s, about 65% of the population, which was roughly 58 million people, lived in rural areas. Richard Sears lived in North Redwood, Minnesota, where he was an agent at the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railway, Railway Station. Excuse me, Sears began trading products such as lumber, coal, and watches when the trains would pass through. Sears moved to Chicago in 1893 and partnered with Alva C. Roebuck and the Sears and Roebuck Company was born. The company first published a 32-page catalog selling watches and jewelry. By 1895 the catalog was 532 pages long and included everything from fishing tackle to glassware. In 1893, sales reached $400,000, and by 1895, sales topped $750,000. Sears invented many new marketing campaigns and concepts that are still in use today, including a series of rewards or loyalty programs for customers who passed copies of the catalog on to friends and relatives. They were quite innovative with how they used their information. Um, Sears was one of the first companies to recognize the importance of building strong customer relationships. Sears loyalty program gave each customer 24 copies of the catalog to distribute. And the customer would generate points each time an order was placed from one of the catalogs by a new customer. The Sears catalog became a marketing classic. It brought the world to the isolated farms and was a feast for the new consumers. 
the entire world was available through the Sears catalog and it could be delivered to the remotest doorsteps. Even as early as 1893, Sears started looking at ways of making decisions based on data and data intelligence. And that's kind of what kicks off with this topic and this chapter. <coughs> decision making. Certainly Sears had um, decisions to make in the process. And it includes the six steps. Now you need to make sure you're remember these, especially come testing time. The first, problem identification. The second, data collection. Third, solution generation. Fourth, solution testing. Thir fifth, solution selection. And sixth, solution implementation. Now, problem identification. In that step, you have to be able to define the problem clearly and as precisely as possible. If you are on a fact-finding mission and you are responsible for identifying and collecting information about a problem for your team and for your team to address, you need to try to ask as many questions up front as possible in order to properly and as thoroughly as possible identify the problem. The second, data collection. Data collection looks at things such as why are certain processes falling apart? It seeks to answer and what are the immediate steps the company can take to adjust the current processes to improve them. Who are you listening to and are they actual or rumor complaints? And that's a big one. You, in this process, and as you delve more into um, getting experience and being analyst and using data to analyze situations, which is what we're introducing here, um, you have to be able to keep emotion and keep feelings out of the process, try to be as black and white as possible in approaching problems and try and in order to be able to filter through to be as objective as possible in order to separate fact from fiction, rumors from reality. Um, the last question data collection seeks to answer, what departments are struggling? What departments or individuals within the organization are impacted by this problem? Solution generation, the third step. What are some of the solutions you have for improvement? In other words, this is where the ideas for problem solving start coming into play. What are some of the solutions your management team have? Any successful leader, no matter how high up the chain you are, it could be as low as a team lead. Um, every successful leader is, should be smart enough to listen to those around them more than they listen to themselves. And that's emphasized here. Get the feedback and get the input from your team. And then the uh, third question sought to be answered by solution generation. How will you go about collecting all the best solutions? You want to be able to choose from more than one, so that way you have as best of a solution as possible. Because a good solution reflects on good leadership, which reflects back on your ability. Solution test. Are the solutions long-term or short-term? Is it a Band-Aid or is this something that's going to fix the problem? Sometimes you have to put the Band-Aid in place in order to get to the long-term solution. Other times, the Band-Aid should not be applied at all and you need to go ahead and take the plunge and do what's needed for the long-term permanent solution. What are some of the cost factors associated with the solution? Does your team like the solution or are they going to sabotage it because they are unhappy with the decision made? Now, <coughs> obviously, you have to be in a leadership role in order 
to make decisions in terms of what solution you're going to take and apply. So for that reason, this last point, not everyone is always going to be happy with the decision that you make. But because you have done due diligence in these first steps in identifying the problem and looking at analyzing the data and selecting a solution and testing the solution, you have to stand confident in that decision. And you have to remember it's not a popularity test that you competition, a popularity competition that you've been hired for. You've been hired to make the organization successful. So like it or lump it, they have to follow suit with what you've done. But all good leaders still get the input and they seek the advice of those around them and they're transparent enough to discuss with the team. You may not like the solution, but these are the reasons why. Solution selection. As the executive leader of the company, are you comfortable with the decision you made? That goes back on what I was just talking about. How are you going to take a strong lead on the decision without alienating yourself? That's an important question there for solution selection. And that feeds back into what I was just saying. Transparency, honesty, and communication go a really long way in helping you to not alienate yourself as a dictator of a leader. By communicating, by being upfront with people, by letting them know that, that even though they may not like what you're saying, they know you're being honest with them and, sh and that you're shooting straight, you'll still keep them on your side and you'll still keep them as followers instead of little minions who are there to obey your every command. The last, solution implementation. Evaluate and track the solution. Hang on. Evaluate and track how the solution is working. <clears throat> is it achieving the results that you wanted? Are the results poor? What steps do you need to take to adjust? As the leader for the company, how will you appropriately change the solution direction without upsetting the environment or flow of the employees and production? No one's perfect. There is no one that always creates perfect solutions. Failure is inevitable. But it's what you do with the failure and how you have approached these preceding five steps that, de de that determine how your followers, how your employees, how your teammates are going to respond to the mistake and the bad call that you might have made. So it's important to do due diligence to those first five steps for that very reason. Now, in making decisions, there are three steps or three um, levels in every organization for decision making. The first and the most basic is the operational. The second is managerial and then the third is strategic. Now at the operational level, here's the activities that happen within decision making. And within any organization at every level, the members of the organization should be encouraged to take part of the decision, decision making process. Even someone as low as a jan janitor or janitorial staff who's definitely on the operational level, um, they should be allowed to be able to make some decisions within their job functions. So everyone that's a part of the organization should make and have a part in decision making. So in understanding where they belong in, the, in these three tiers, 
it helps to be able to know the level of decision making and how to make the decisions and that's what we're going to look at here so for operational employees develop control and maintain core business activities required to run day-to-day -day operations the employee type and well first of all the type of decisions here are structured meaning that situations where established processes offer potential solutions in other words if we go somewhere like Walmart and we're going to return an item the person working the customer service desk belongs in the operational tier and they have certain procedures and policies to follow to help them determine whether or not an item is is going to be accepted as a return that's a structured decision and that and there are established guidelines and policies for them to follow to make that decision they don't have to go running to the supervisor with every item to say hey can I accept this exchange or can I give the customer their money back this exists and those established procedures exist to help free up the time of the supervisor and the managers so they can make their decisions and do their functions without having to micromanage this operational level um, decision types we said was structured they can also be recurring and repetitive um, key performance indicators this key performance indicators will be something that we talk about a little bit later but here key performance indicators focus on efficiency um, examples include how many employees are out sick how many products are needed to be made today what are next week's production requirements how much inventory is in the warehouse and how many problems occurred when running payroll so <clears throat> those are types of structured reoccurring repetitive type questions that come up that employees can follow a certain set of guidelines and procedures to answer those and perform their functions the second managerial employees evaluate company operations to identify adapt to and leverage change so here there's a little bit more flexibility in the decision making it's not as rigid it's not as structured it's semi-structured it occurs in situations in which a few established processes help to evaluate potential solutions but not enough to lead to definite recommended decisions so in other words there will be situations that come up that managers need to handle and while there are certain expectations in making those decisions there's no hard set rules that say you must in most cases you must do X Y and Z you must follow steps one two and three um, here the KPIs focus on efficiency and the critical success factors which is some, another topic we'll talk about when we talk about um, the KPIs the critical success factors focus on effectiveness so here we're look, going to be gauging efficiency and effectiveness um, examples include who are the best cu customers by region by sales rep or by product what are the sales forecast for next month how do they compare to actual sales for last year um, what's the difference between expected sales and actual sales for each month so again the questions that managers seek to answer are a little bit more open-ended the third tier the strategic here managers develop overall strategies goals and objectives in other words this is where your annual um, organizational goals are developed what does your company 
What is your company looking to accomplish in the upcoming year? These are unstructured decisions. They occur in situations in which no procedures or rules exist. There's no guidance for the decision makers in how to make a choice. Um, because they are developing the choices for the managers to use, for the managers to move forward. This uh, level of strategic decision making uh, belongs to the executive staff instead of middle management. Um, their focus is external industry and cross company. These are long term annual or multi-year uh, goals that they seek to set. Um, it's unstructured, non-recurring, and one time. Here the focus on uh, critical success factors focus on effectiveness. Um, examples include how will changes in employment levels over the next three years impact the company? What industry trends are worth analyzing? What new products and new markets does the company need to create competitive advantages? How will a recession over the next years impact business? Here they're looking at how are we going to sustain ourselves, keep making money, keep being profitable for the stakeholders and the shareholders because paychecks really matter in this. Nobody works for free or for the fun of it. And so they look at how do we need to guide and steer the company. Now, I told you we were going to talk about KPIs or key performance indicators and CSF, critical success factors. And to introduce that, we're going to come up with, well, not come up, we're going to uh, bring up two terms, project and metrics. A project is a temporary activity a company undertakes to create a unique product, service, or result. Now, when we conclude this course, the last chapter we talk about is project management. So we will go into that in a lot more detail. <coughs> this just introduces the idea and concept of that. Metrics is the measurement that evaluate results to determine whether a, proje whether a project is meeting its goals. And with metrics comes the first term, CSF, critical success factor. Um, throughout the course, whenever you come across acronyms, um, you need to make sure that you remember what they are because in testing, they will refer to it simply by the acronym as opposed to the full word. For example, when you take the midterm, you will see CSF as opposed to critical success factor. The CSF is the crucial steps companies make to perform to achieve their goals and objectives and implement strategies. Strategies such as create high quality products, retain competitive advantages, reduce pro product cost, increase customer satisfaction, hire and retain the best professionals. These, in other words, the critical success factors become the small steps to take to meet an objective, to meet a goal. These are the tasks that have to be done. What is critical for the success of this project? What has to happen? The other term that they introduce is KPI or key performance indicator. These are quantifiable metrics a company uses to evaluate progress toward the critical success factor. So the critical success factors are those critical success steps that have to be taken to meet a goal. And the KPIs become 
the measurement. Are we on target? How far off target are we? I can position myself to face an object two miles down the road, assuming that I have clear vision and I can see the object that far off. Now, if I were to start walking in a determined line, and if I were to get off course of that line, even just a half, just a half step to the left or to the right, that might be a little bit off target within the first few feet that I walk, but by the time I try to reach my target, I might be three miles away from my target because the further you go at an angle, the f bigger the angle comes, right? So the key performance indicators help to make sure that you're not going off target as you're going towards meeting that goal. Um, here, examples of crucial steps or uh, critical success factors include create high quality products retain competitive advantage, reduce product cost, increase customer satisfaction, and hire and retain the best business professionals. The key performance indicator examples, what are the turnover rates of employees? Do I have a high turnover rate? Well, if so, that's going to signal that I'm not able to retain the best business professionals. And that would mean I need to look at something that's happening internally to see why people are leaving. Um, percentage of help desk calls answered in the first minute. Number of product returns. Well, if I'm looking at creating high quality products, <coughs> and that's one of my goals, well, I need to measure how many of those products are coming back due to defects because if there's a high number of defects, then I'm not really creating a high quality product, am I? Um, the number of new customers and the average customer spending. So those are examples of, of what to measure um, when looking at KPIs. Now here they conveniently define KPIs after they uh, give an example of it, but here a KPI is the quantifiable metrics a company uses to evaluate progress towards critical success factors. Um, and again, they give examples of what they can include. We've covered those, so I will not belabor that point. Now KPIs um, come into two categories, external or internal. External KPIs look at the market share. How much of the market does my company or does my product um, occupy? Internal KPIs looks at the return on investment. It indicates the earning power of a project. If I spent $2,000 to make a project happen, how much am I getting back as a result of that project being in place? If I'm only getting a $50 return on that, then perhaps that should not have been pursued. And so we use KPIs to help measure that. Now, KPIs look at both efficiency and effectiveness. <coughs> efficiency measures the performance of MIS itself, such as throughput. How much are we able to make and produce? That's throughput. Transaction speed, how quickly, are we re how quickly are we responding? And then system availability, is the system continually up? Is the system down? What's the state of the system? 
Effectiveness measures the impact MIS has on business processes and activities, including customer satisfaction and customer conversion rates. Are we being effective in how we're running our business? Now here, as you can see, the optimal area that all organizations want to operate in is in the upper right-hand quadrant. High effectiveness, high efficiency. That's where the ideal operations occur. <clears throat> when we're looking at KPIs, in order to determine if a measurement is effective or if a measurement is efficient, we have to establish a benchmark. The benchmark becomes a baseline value the system seeks to attain. So, for example, in one of my jobs, my full-time employment, I am a high school teacher, and one of the things that we look at measuring is the efficiency rating of the students and in their performance. And so we look at benchmark numbers such as what was the test scores of my class on the same subject last semester versus what is the test scores averages on this semester. So that helps determine as a KPI my effectiveness as an instructor. Similarly, within the classroom, now that's what the state looks at, but within the classroom, I will establish certain benchmarks like that. I will give a pretest on a topic before the individuals will be exposed to the material. I know it sounds kind of unfair. Most will receive a very low score, obviously. But then, when it's time for them to actually be tested for mastery of a topic, I have something to compare what the result, end result is versus where they started. And that's where this concept of benchmark and benchmarking comes into play. Benchmarking is the continual measurement of the system. Now, in using MIS to make business decisions, a lot of times the uh, decision makers will create what's called a model. A model is a simplified representation or abstraction of reality, such as when you were kids, for those of you that were guys, you might have built model airplanes or model cars. That's an abstraction of what a real car or real airplane really is. But here, models come in the form of data. This data allows the managers to calculate risk. If I, going back to some of those questions that the managerial level seeks to answer, such as, uh, number of employments. <clears throat> what would it, they can put in an increased number of employees to see what the numbers might look like. And conversely, they can um, reduce the number of employees to see how a reduction of employees may impact production. Understand uncertainty change variables. Again, they can play with employment numbers to see how um, labor hours and operations and throughput would look like. And manipulate time to make decisions. Um, here they've charted out for us what the uh, decision making looks like. Um, this becomes what they call a decision support system. Well, hang on, let me back up. Here they've graphed the type of decisions to make, and along the bottom, they've graphed the three levels, the operational, managerial, and strategic. Um, 
the type of decision support system or the type of decision making system I guess I should say that a structured operational employee would seek to use would be transaction processing system such as a cash register system to allow the customer service to <coughs> accept returns. The managers with semi-structured decision making use a decision support system that allows them to see numbers such as sales, labor hours, and things like that to answer those type of questions that we discussed. And then last, the strategic and unstructured decisions for the strategic level use an, an executive information system, which is more of an overall broad type of data and decision support that they, that they use. Um, here it talks about an operational support system. The transaction support system or TPS is a basic business system that serves the operational level and assists in making structured decisions. Um, such as a cash register at customer service might be able to look up and tell whether something is in, whether something is in stock or not. Online transaction processing, OLTP, is the capturing of transaction and event information using technology to process, store, and update. In other words, it's just using a computer system to do it with. The source document is the original transaction record. In other words, where did the data that went into the computer system originate from? Well, in the case of a customer service accepting in an exchange or a, um, giving the money back, the original transaction record would have been the original receipt. That goes back to some of the concepts in accounting. Here is a um, diagram of the operational support system. You have the three phases. You have input, you have process, you have output. And then down at the bottom, just like we saw in chapter one, we have feedback. <coughs> Excuse me. This, again, is a uh, overview of the systems thinking that we had, that we had uh, previously discussed. CRUD stands for Create, Read, Update, and delete. Calculate and then summarize. Managerial support systems in include online analytical processing or OLAP. This is the manipulation of information to create business intelligence in support of strategic decision making. Decision Support System, or DSS, models information to support managers and business professionals during the decision making process. Such as an, an accounts payable system, accounts receivable system, course registration system, and human resource system for tracking things like sick days and vacation days. There's four quantitative models used by DSS. They are in what if analysis. What if I increased my workforce by five employees? What if I reduced my hours of operation by two hours a day? Sensitivity analysis goal-seeking, and optimization. Sensitivity is the study of the impact that changes in one or more parts of the model have on the other parts of the model. If you've taken quantitative analysis as part of your study yet, these things come into play in that course. Uh, goal-seeking analysis finds the inputs necessary to achieve a goal such as a desired level of output. If I want to be able to produce 500 units a day instead of 250 units a day, 
What do I need to add to the mix in order to make that happen? And then optimization analysis is an extension of goal seeking. It finds the optimum value for a target variable by repeatedly changing other variables subject to specified constraints. And again, a lot of these concepts, these four, these four models, obviously, you will learn about in quantitative analysis in depth. <coughs> Systems thinking for the managerial support system. Uh, your input is your TPS. Your processes include your what if, sensitivity, goal seeking, optimization. Your output include forecast, simulations, and ad hoc reports. And then, of course, in all three of the parts, you have feedback as you go along the way. Here's just another graphical representation of a managerial support system. These are the interactions between the TPS and the DSS. TPS being Transaction Processing System. I would be familiar with that flow. Last, the Strategic Support System. Um, again, you have the three levels, Operational, Managerial, and Strategic. And you can see that as it's more basic, as it's more transactional, it involves looking at all of the processes. The OLTP was looking more at the processing, and when it's fine, it's going to be looking more at the strategic level. Lastly, the Executive Information System is a specialized DSS that supports senior level executives within the organization. Here, things such as granularity, visualization, and digital dashboard. Now, for one of your projects, for your entrepreneurial challenge, you're going to have to create a digital dashboard for your company. <coughs> Here is another visualization of the interaction between the TPS, the transaction processing systems, and the EIS. Nothing that you're going to be overly tested on on that, but just some basic information from that. Um, the strategic support systems, the most EISSs offer the following capability. Consolidation, drill down, slice and dice, and pivot. Consolidation involves the aggregation of information and features simple roll-ups to complex groupings of interrelated information. In other words, consolidation is going to start out with a summarized view of the data. Drill down allows users to get details and details of details of information. So the executives don't necessarily want to start out by looking at the uh, minute details. They want to start looking at a summarized view of the data. And then where and when, where and when they desire, they will choose to drill down for further information as needed. Slice and Dice looks at information from different perspectives. And then Pivot rotates data to display alternative presentations of the data. Lastly, Individuals can use artificial intelligence to make decisions. Um, artificial intelligence simulates human intelligence, such as the ability to reason and learn. And then intelligence system is a various commercial ap applications of artificial intelligence. The five most common categories include the first is an expert system. Now, you do need to be familiar with these types and these categories because you're going to have to apply them uh, to different scenarios and be able to identify which would apply to which scenario. 
An expert system is a computerized advisory program that imitates the reasoning processes of experts in solving difficult problems. In other words, it kind of replaces the doctor in being able to analyze why your little toe hurts. You put in your symptoms, and as you're putting in symptoms, it knows what questions to keep asking to come up to the solution. A neural network attempts to emulate the way the human brain works. Fuzzy logic is a mathematical method of handling imprecise or subjective information. Kind of like the gray areas of decision making. The third area or third category of artificial intelligence is genetic algorithm, which is an artificial intelligence system that mimics the evolutionary survival of the fittest process to generate increasingly better solutions to a problem, such as a shopping bot, which is a software that will search several retailer websites and provide a comparison of each retailer's offerings, such as Travelocity or some of those other websites that compare prices. Now the genet genetic algorithm is intended for the system to learn with the user. And the more that the user uses the system, the more the system can adapt and produce the results and operate in a way that's more custom to that user. A lot of your websites employ this type of um, technology through the use of cookies and, and other little files that they'll put on your machine in order to track your web traffic, your web travels, to customize those pages to give you the pop-ups that meet your interest. Um, the fourth, an intelligent agent is a special purpose knowledge-based information system that accomplishes specific tasks on behalf of its users. And then last, virtual reality is a com computer simulated environment that can be a simulation of the real world or imaginary world, um, such as a lot of the video games and the VR reality that uh, some of your cell phone providers are utilizing, like uh, the Galaxy and the Samsung phones. They have the little headgears that allow you to watch 3D movies and virtual reality type uh, recordings. So be familiar with those types of AI and in decision making and be able to um, 